Nyx does a lot of things, but what would you say is the main problem that Nyx is attempting to solve? I'd say reproducibility mm -hmm. and dependency management. Mm -hmm. Because those kind of come hand in hand. And the way Nyx sort of solves this is everything's predictable. Mm -hmm. And by being predictable, you're reproducible. It's not a one or you don't get one without the other exactly, mm -hmm. but they come hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And the way Nick does this is by doing like have an evaluation to where, oh, it only references this specific package for its dependency. It's just because we're using that. Mm -hmm. But some packages and stuff like C compilers like to tag things in like the time something built mm -hmm. or some arbitrary path. And so we have these concepts and stuff, or not really concepts, these different features mm -hmm. within Nix packages strips that information out. Mm -hmm. And so what we can do is as long as your operating system and your CPU and generic build configurations the same, mm -hmm. you can build the same package on two different systems, we're at two different times of the day, mm -hmm. and they should be a binary equivalent. Mm -hmm. You do a diff, and they should show it's exactly the same number of duplicate bytes. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you have some weird things like C compilers. I think Java is one of those weird things. Google projects, because Google packages things weirdly, that getting them reproducible is hard, mm -hmm but not impossible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And since from there, since it's reproducible, you've kind of solved the dependency management problem. Mm -hmm. Reproducibility is a very loaded term that a lot of people don't really understand correctly. Um, and you often hear discussions like, oh, this system is fully reproducible, that system is fully reproducible. Um... When we say reproducibility, let's just focus specifically on that. What does that term itself mean, and why would you care about it, right? Like, let, let's say you have a system where you compile an application, it looks, it, it's the same application, it looks the same to the user, but it's not going to be binary equivalent. What is the benefit of it being binary equivalent? But, um, yeah, start with, um... It, just to yes. focus on the reproducibility term itself. Yeah, so kind of think of it as basic math. You have a function which takes two arguments, A and B. And you just do a simple operation of A plus B. And so you, let's say you plug in 1 for A and B is 2. That is going to be 3. Mm -hmm. So the that kind of idea of just like, as long as your inputs are the same, mm -hmm. the output should be predictable. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of goes a little bit more back into the language where, because we have the hash, we know what things should output like. Mm -hmm. But that's only for evaluations. Mm -hmm. And so we apply this concept to the packages we build. Mm -hmm. And from there, we're able to guarantee that these packages are going to be able to operate the same and debug the same and do anything the same anywhere. Mm -hmm. And reproducibility is important because let's say you have a regression mm -hmm. with something and you want to track it. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? You bisect it. But what happens when something doesn't match up because it's not reproducible? You could get a false positive of what looks like it could be a problem, mm -hmm. but it could be, oh, this, this date changed inside the build hash, causing things to change around. You don't want that. Mm -hmm. So reproducing that to where it's going to be the same in 20 years as it was five weeks ago 
makes that a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even have to be for like uh, debugging. It could be for uh, like modular management of like some programmers have a way of being able to add plugins and stuff, and mm -hmm. sometimes they want things to order correctly. Being able to reproduce it correctly makes sense there. And so it kind of depends on what you're wanting, but it, at the end of the day, it is a concept that should apply everywhere. Right. Yeah, reproducibility and the value of it really depends on where in the product chain you're you're sort of sitting, right? Like if you're if you're in a corporate environment, you know, having reproducible builds is more resilient against software attacks because you can verify the build you have is the build that it is supposed to be. Yeah, especially for like that kind of thing. Or even like servers, like let's say mm -hmm. you are on a DevOps team and you have to manage 20 servers. You want it where everything's going to be the same. Right. Because the idea is you want to minimize the amount of variables. By minimizing the amount of variables down, you have a lot more predictability. Right? Being able to predict things, mm -hmm. you can then squash bugs easier mm -hmm. or easily. You know exactly what's going on. Hmm. Okay, so this is, we're just gonna—I've just been jumping around between different Nick's topics. I'm not really sure the best way to connect these things together. Um, but I, I guess let's talk about um, package rollbacks because that's a, a a big one that a lot of a lot of systems just don't have anything really in place to do so. Like Arch, you can roll back a package but basically what that means is going to the package archive repo and then installing the old version of the package which potentially if you're doing something low level enough could break the entire system but that's not the sort of thing we're talking about here and with the the way we've talked about how packages work where they're all stored in their own separate directory uh with their own id and they control their own dependency management it sounds like rollbacks, and it, it mentioned on the homepage here that rollbacks are something that are easy to do. How are rollbacks facilitated through Nix? So the way you do it is, as you're aware, everything evaluates. Mm -hmm. And so the inputs, which are your attributes, mm -hmm. to the attributes that this passes through duration, mm -hmm. you basically just undo the change. Like, oh, you have this source mm -hmm. that points to, like, let's say, 0.1.6 mm -hmm. and oh that is broken when you roll back to 0.1.5 mm -hmm. what you do is you just change the source mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you have the old version and luckily for you if it's in your cache or somewhere that you can get it from you don't even have to rebuild it because nothing else changed mm -hmm. and so you can actually apply this to Nick's OS a little bit further by having multiple generations of your system mm -hmm. to where let's say generation 20 broke mm -hmm. just reboot go back to generation 19 nothing's broken and so you're able to just manage things a lot easily as long as you can work backwards from going forwards mm -hmm. when a lot of people talk about rollbacks on linux distros a lot of the the focus right now are on these these i don't know what term you want to you like using for them these image based or immutable atomic distros where basically you just roll back the entire system and you just have multiple versions of the system installed but nix is more akin to traditional package management obviously it's still nix's different nick system but it's still it's not like you can roll back individual things right it's it's still you're handling packages separately from each other yeah so you can easily just roll back things like that where and because nix isn't or nixos isn't really immutable mm -hmm. 
it kind of actually is because mm-hmm. you can't just arbitrarily write to the next door. And so the kind of benefit you get is Nix is only going to touch Nix things. Mm-hmm. When you roll back an image-based distro, you're going to be rolling back a lot of things. You're going to have a lot of downloads. You're just going to you just have a lot more complexity. With this, you can just roll back one single thing, and that's it. The layer operation, you don't have to even download that much. Mm-hmm. And it's just simpler. Right, I have heard anytime the discussion of immutable distros comes up, it is, like, the, the topic of Nix comes up as well. It's obviously very different from, you know, a, a silver blue, but it's approaching that immutability problem in a different way. Yeah, so, like, with immutable distros, typically people do I don't like, like the term, group personally. Group. I like image-based. It, it's, it's such, there's no good term for it, because there's, no, there's no individual word that explains everything that a, a silver blue-like distro really encompasses. Yeah, like, those kinds of things, they do weird things that mm-hmm. certain packages may not like. Like, I know systemd doesn't quite like having your root file system locked. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you want to be able to change around your system at runtime, especially if you're messing with something weird like Xorg, mm-hmm. because new drivers and stuff like that don't quite always apply. And so the kind of benefit you get with Nix is... You can change things mm-hmm. without, like, having to... I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. With, like, a locked root FS, mm-hmm. you just can't touch anything. But with NixOS, you can still touch your Etsy and all that, as long as you have the permission. Mm-hmm. But if you reboot, your changes are rolled back because the system reactivates. So you can kind of test drive some things at runtime, mm-hmm. make your fixes, whatever, and then update your configuration, and now you kind of lock things in. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so you can have you can have more of a, more of an agile, like work workaround method to try to figure out why is this thing not working, and things generally play nicer since you're not messing with weird file system permissions and stuff like that. It's just you have a single directory that is locked behind a daemon, mm-hmm. and that's really it. 